So yeah, my name is Joel Mark. I'm founder and CEO of Architect Services. So um, we we kind of uh, set up the portfolio delivery community um, uh, actually in January 2020. Yeah, so six months ago now. Flip neck, time flies when you're having fun. Um, and this community was about bringing in practitioners and, and, and specialist uh, resources and knowledge and sharing that against a community of uh, of individuals who deliver change. Um, and so we've had a few uh, successful kind of uh, events that have gone down really well. We've had some really positive feedback. So thank you for those who are returning. Uh, really do appreciate your, your support and hope you find the sessions valuable. Um, and yeah, so so Martin, I'll let Martin introduce himself in a couple, a couple of minutes time before he kicks off into his uh, into his slide deck uh, that he'll take you through the day. Uh, do you want to hit next for me again, please, Martin, mate? Thank you. Uh, so just by, by way of background, then, so Microsoft, uh, sorry, so Icotech are a key uh, Microsoft implementation partner. Uh, we specialize in SharePoint, uh, Power BI and project um, solutions. So uh, we deliver project online, a project for the web, uh, you know, and all things power apps and dynamics, a myriad of things really. Um, but especially we're, 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 you know, kind of uh, we're focused on delivering of project portfolio management solutions. So we're working with Martin uh, because we are kind of services combine and align quite nicely. Uh, but I'll just give you a brief summary of, of, of uh, project online specifically, and then let Martin kick off into the uh, into the uh, into the juicy stuff. So just by way of background, do you want to hit next a few times, Martin? I normally kind of just flash through this stuff. <laughs> it's a bit weird not driving my own slide deck. It's a bit bizarre. I feel like I'm yeah, sorry I'm not, about that. I'm not, sorry, I'm not, I feel like I'm not in control. <laughs> I hate that feeling. Uh, but just a bit about Icotech then. So uh, we service the likes of Betty's and Taylor's who manufacture Yorkshire Tea, um, Office for National Statistics, uh, Intellectual Property Office, uh, and Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. So uh, we're servicing those organizations and companies house to deliver um, project portfolio management solutions really. Um, so that's just a bit, about, a bit about us. Uh, next slide. So Project Online, what is Project Online? It'd be surprised how many people I speak to actually who don't re recognize they've got this enterprise-wide project management solution within Office 365. Um, it's, it's really kind of uh, interesting how people say, oh yeah, I'm using I'm using Project Online, and actually it transpires using Microsoft Project as in the desktop app to manage one single project or, or maybe a program. Um, but when we when we show them that actually with a, with a few days of support and, and effort from our side, uh, we can configure Project Online to manage a portfolio of projects, uh, they're quite surprised by that. Um, so what we do is take Project Online, configure it with our knowledge and experience of our practitioners um, and deliver that to our customer base really. Uh, next slide, Martin. I'm pressing the next button on it. <laughs> so just uh, too far, too far. <laughs> so just by the way, a couple of screenshots rather than going through anything more too fancy. So Project Online, what's it look like? It's, it's a flexible portfolio management solution. So how I explained it to, to our clients and our partners is that you know whether you're managing a portfolio, a program or projects, or even continuous improvement, we can set up the solution to deliver those uh, those change activities. So whether you're trying to link those to investments, uh, strategy, strategies, or trying to prioritize them, um, you can manage this concatenation of project activity in one place and provide lots of metrics around KPIs, um, life cycles. So here on the left-hand side, you can see that we've got an agile project. People say you can't manage an agile project in Microsoft Project. You can. Uh, we can configure it to do that. Um, and that's just a bit of a, an outline, really, of, of how it looks and feels. Uh, next again, Martin, please. So just uh, by way of reference, so so we we kind of take a project environment and we will uh, understand your KPIs. Uh, so we can deliver automatic KPIs that basically uh, will rag a project based on the data that's within it. So um, a lot of people uh, that I've worked with in my corporate career um, and still our customers today are ragging projects by by gut feel subjectivity, uh, which which isn't great. When you've got a hundred projects in your portfolio, you can't draw any conclusions from that trend or that data if people are just gut feeling rag statuses. When you can you know formulaically work out uh, the rag status of a project. Uh, you're able to capture that data over time, and therefore you're able to draw conclusions from that from that data, which is really what we enjoy doing um, and, and and love to do. So uh, next slide, please, mine. Uh, just so this is the project site, so you can manage schedules. Um, uh, you know, just we can set up these views so that if you want to do a light touch project management, uh, we have this uh, light touch scheduling view uh, that we put together then as as per the requirement from from the client. Uh, next slide, mine. 
Thank you. Uh, project site. So uh, we, this is how you can manage risks and issues. So you could you know, put your risks in here, your issues, your deliverables, your documents, and you can share this with anybody uh, who's using Office 365. So it's quite interactive and friendly and uh, uh, a lot of our customers enjoy these, this type of flexibility really. Next, next one. Thank you. Uh, and so what, what, why do we capture all this data? Well, the idea is we, we, we report on it, so we visualize it. So we use Power BI directly plugged into uh, Project Online to visually and graphically represent this data. So you can see this project, this portfolio has got 32 projects in it. Uh, and if this was live, um, you could click on those bars and it would dynamically update the content on that report. Uh, there are some standard out the box reports, and then we've got our own Icotech standard as well uh, that we deliver to our clients as well. Cool. Next. Thank you. So status reports, I hated status reports. Friday morning, you know, PMO manager, portfolio manager saying, where's my status report? Can you go and get it, please? You know, I remember copying the plan, copying my risk log, my financial tracker, putting it all into my status report, making up a rag, PDFing it and sending it to my PMO manager. Um, and, and actually what, what, what in reality happens is that the, 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 the status report became the actual master data and, and the raid log became the secondary data. And it was just a pain and I hated those mornings. Um, so this is about hit and refresh. All those artifacts you've seen you know, of me flash through there in terms of risks, issues, one version of the truth, one way of getting the data out. Um, and it's something that our customers really, really enjoy is not having to spend the time on a Friday or Monday morning, whatever your reporting cycle is, getting that data out of the tool. So that's just a whistle stop tour of what we what we do and what what how Icotech work on the systems that we del deliver. So I'll hand over to Martin to take us on to the uh, to the real meat of the uh, of the conversation. Really, so thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Joel. Really appreciate it. Now, um, in terms of this talk today, it's about advanced data analytics for project delivery. So let me start the main presentation. So. Um, uh, we're really, really passionate about project data analytics. So Joel's been doing the stuff in terms of making sure they're squeezing what we possibly can from Microsoft. And in terms of this presentation, I'm going to really open your mind to the potential of advanced data analytics. So what we're going to talk about is its impact inside of projects and what it means for your jobs, uh, preparing yourself for this future and the way to get started. We talked about Menti already you've seen about Menti. Uh, so we've talked through this about the impact on your role. Um, and I'd like to talk through now, why am I here? Um, and why am I talking to you? So um, projected success has been going since 2014 and I was a 50% shareholder in a second business. I sold out of that business and I pivoted in 2017 and just before I pivoted as well I started to really get into project data analytics lessons learned etc etc so we realized at that point that project data was not being utilized properly so we find the instance um, of lessons learned data is there's loads of people take that data and they compress it into some statements and they say there you go We've looked back over a project and we've learned something from this project that we can roll through into future projects. And it doesn't really work. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So as a consequence of that, in December 2017, we founded the Project Data Analytics community and that's grown to, I think it's 5,600 members now. Um, and what we're trying to do as a consequence of that community is to inspire people and to upskill them and to get them really thinking about project data analytics. So we're trying to shape that as well. It's not just about project data analytics, it's about data trust and pooling this data and to get to a situation where we've got enough data to really drive transformational change. So we think it's gonna make a massive difference to every single person's job who's involved in project delivery. And it's not a tweak to your job, it may be a very, very different job in the future. So in terms of my background, um, I'm a fellow of the APM, I'm a chartered project professional, chartered engineer. Uh, I've been a, a project lead on a, a project in Aldermaston, which was a billion dollar nuclear new build project. I've been a program director on 600 million pounds worth, worth of project, 600 million dollars worth of project, sorry. And I've been portfolio lead for a 10 billion portfolio when we ran the PMO in Corsham for the MOD and we won that job against Atkins. So that's pretty cool and I led that job. So I've done some big jobs uh, and I've seen where 
uh, project data analytics works and where it doesn't work. And in the main, across industry at the moment, we don't really value this data. So if we think about today and where we are today, machines are moving on at pace. So we can do things like automated road design. And there's a company called Bride and Wood, and they can look at uh, your landscape and they can look at the logic associated with road design and they can now do automated layouts of roads and they've open sourced that uh, technology as well and they've said because it's all logic based we can just put some maths around it and we can auto code that so we can do that with code with, with roads for instance like, can we start to do this in projects in the future so we can lay out buildings as well and it's called uh, genitive design and there's various companies do it and they give you uh, various iterations of that same design and you can start to look at some of those scenarios which are most specific to the uh, demands of your role and we can do things like predicting the weather and see what the met office does it takes huge data sets and it starts to use that so we can look at likelihood of cancer we can identify patterns in data uh, to detect fraud uh, but the problem is with projects we don't tend to do that right we struggle to leverage all of that data in project delivery and i think that's one of our biggest problems at the moment as we've got loads and loads of data which says on previous uh, uh, projects we've seen these risks arise we've seen the schedule variance we know that these things don't happen as well as these other projects but just imagine if we start to change that right if we can start to read a specification and say it's this sort of project and as a consequence of reading that specification we can start to automatically schedule a project if we can assess the probability of certain benefits being realized versus some of those benefits being overclaimed we can assess the effectiveness of project management we can preempt change and there's some examples there in terms of risks and risk management and scheduling and cost and quality and safety and resources and change you know this goes on and on and on once we start to use this data uh, to give us insights into lead indicators and understand the predisposition to change and, and predisposition to variance and if we start to do that we will change the way we deliver projects forever and i think that's the really exciting bit so if we start to think about risk analysis right so if we drill into risk analysis, if you start to type into risk uh, tools and you say, I've got this sort of risk, it can give you a recommender system that says, if you've seen these sort of risks, you're probably going to be predisposed to these risks as well. And if you start to type the risk in, instead of you spending uh, 15 minutes being a pedant talking about the definition of a risk, and I've spent loads of hours in risk meeting just arguing about the language of it, it starts to auto-complete. And you've probably got a thousand risks for your organization and it's those risks which tend to occur time and time again and just auto complete and get the machine to fill it in if you've got a certain sort of project for instance like um, a software delivery project which is doing a certain scope it might be an auto population of that risk register but you've got to be careful of doing that because it can de-skill the role and you don't look at the uh, specific circumstances of a project but you can augment it and i think that's quite exciting you can look at risk windows where you need heightened awareness of risk and what the predisposition is of certain parts of project a certain sort of risk risk awareness so which risks tend to spin up really quickly and catch you out by surprise and which ones creep in so it's the a rate of emergence and things like risk vectors and i think that's quite interesting as well and we can start doing some stuff on that so what are lead indicators to these risk coming out what the risk of sort of mitigation effectiveness so which of those risks have been solved well and which of those risks you spent a lot of money and it's still turned into an issue and it still costs you a fortune which of those risks can be treated which ones have got to be um uh, tolerated for instance so what's the effectiveness of that risk drawdown and that contingency? And in terms of providing assurance, what's the forecast versus actual, and which of those risks tend to be underestimated? Um, and I think what's really cool about this as well, you can start to look at the performance of your risk team as well. 
So you can start to say, are people in my team have been effective at managing risk or not? And have they understood which of these risks have started to catch them out late? So they're asleep on the job. So if we look uh, 12 months from now, is it a different role? So we've got a risk manager at the moment, you know, who's on anywhere from 25 grand up to 75 grand. And that's the nature of their job at the moment. So they're about collating risk, documenting risk, assigning actions, going in, reporting and monitoring risk. They don't actually do risk management. They don't actually uh, come up and say, this is what I think all the risks are going to be on the project. They're more of a, a facilitator. So is that job in the future are going to be a forensic and data driven where they can go into this massive data set and do some forensic analysis that says, I think this is what the risk lo landscape looks like for these sort of people in the future. And I think that's a very different sort of role and it's a lot more a data driven role. It's, it's less about uh, chasing people up and being more of a, of a process monkey. And I think that over the past 20 years, I've had a lot of people in my team who's been risk managers and they come around and make sure that you're on top of your risk and you've described them well and you're on top of the processes. But uh, do we need those people in the future if we can use automation to uh, chase people up and run dashboards and that sort of thing? And can that role now change in the future? Or does it look like a very different role? If you're a functional manager on risk, all right, so I can now go into my team as a functional manager and look at the way that somebody's described a risk. And when they've described that risk, is it a good definition or is it something that's a bit weak? You know, the risk is it might be late or has it been quite a forensic risk? So I can now start to mark that through a training data set where I can train it and say, I think these are good risks and these are poor risks. If I can train it, I can then start to rank it. And a bit like when you're putting a password into Google, and it says, you know, you've got a red password or an amber or a green one because it's a strong password. Exactly the same with risks. So we can start to do that. So in terms of capturing the risk that I expect them to as well. And so are they picking up the right scope of those risks? And can they predict those risks? Do they manage them effectively, etc. So I can start to measure that now. So I've now got as a functional manager, I can assess the effectiveness of my team. And that's a bit like in terms of a football manager now, a football coach, I can look at meters run, I can look at number of passes, etc. It's the same with risk. I've now got some KPIs on the performance of my team and their effectiveness at risk management. I've never really had that before because we use risk as a one through process. Stakeholder management is the same. So stakeholder management, so there's principal accountabilities that are pulled from Google and it's more about management, stakeholder engagement plans and, and stakeholders, etc. And just imagine if we've got a dynamic graph database that looks something like that. And that's a picture that I pulled from Neo4j where somebody's uh, taken a script from the Game of Thrones and just mapped it out and said which people are talking to which people and what's the strength of those relationships. And that's dynamic because it's always evolving. And if we start to manage it like, like that, and we can say based upon these past 10 projects, these are the cricket, uh, uh, critical stakeholders and they tend to arise at these parts in a project, that's when it gets really fascinating. We're not doing that today, but we could be. All of this tech is there today. It's all possible today, but we're project managers, we've got head down uh, delivering projects, so we don't look at this stuff. And that's gonna transform the role of a stakeholder manager. Uh, look at project controls. And if you just Google a project controls definition, that's the first thing that comes up. All right. So it's saying about the data gathering, data management, etc. And I didn't pull that in. It's from somebody else. Right. So in terms of that project controls and, and data gathering, etc., it doesn't say in there you've got to be a P6 jockey or you've got to understand the ins and outs of risk, etc. It's saying it's about the use of data. And we're not really doing that today. So if you see the project controls apprenticeship, it mentions data, but it's almost in passing. And it's saying about you need to understand about nesting in schedules. You need to understand about logic and the way that you go in and change parts of a schedule. And that's important. But is that as important as using all of this data that's already there? And when you're estimating uh, timelines in a schedule, should you be doing that by gut feel? You know, I reckon this is going to be three weeks. 
or should you be looking at the data set that actually tells you, you know, we've done it eight times before, we've all, always estimated it's going to be three weeks, and it always takes two months. And we don't necessarily go back and validate those estimates. And that's because we're always looking forward and we don't tend to look behind us. So we can look at schedule and planner and cost estimation, procurement, benefits, management. All of those roles right, will all be impacted significantly by project data analytics. But we still need leadership and we still need people with people management skills. And that's going to be a key part of future project delivery. But a lot of the roles which are process centric roles, we can start to automate in the future and start to make them different. But a lot of those roles are going to be rapidly evolve. And when I say rapidly, I think this is going to be a matter of six to 18 months. And if you're not ready for it, then there's going to be some little junior person who's going to come along as a data ninja and they'll start doing probably 70% of your job for you in some instances. Uh, but there's loads of challenges associated with this, right? It's not easy because there's cultural issues, there's technology issues, there's all sorts of problems with it. So let me start to work through uh, some of those challenges. So the first one is a lack of vision. And I got this thing in the top right hand side from a Logical. So they posted this uh, from their survey, project control survey recently. And they said 49% of people have not thought about using artificial intelligence and 8% of people have been using it. Now, when I speak to people about artificial intelligence, they say, well, I'm using it. And you say, why? They say, well, I'm using a chatbot. And a chatbot is built into things like Office 365. So that uses artificial intelligence. You've got machine vision, for instance. You've got all different things which use artificial intelligence. Now, is that artificial intelligence as a byproduct of project delivery, or is it shaping the way you're managing your schedule, shaping the way you're managing risk, etc.? And I've not seen a lot of companies doing that yet, so I think some of these numbers are probably overclaimed. But it's not just about artificial intelligence, it's about going through that Gartner curve. A descriptive analytics is looking backwards, and that's where most people are at the moment. So we do all of our dashboards, we tend to do reporting that's looking backwards. And if we do uh, forecasts, it tends to be um, uh, through uh, parametric estimates or it tends to be uh, trend lines. It's not really forecasting uh, based upon predictions that's gone before and the way that it's changed. So we need to move into diagnostic analytics about understanding why things went wrong, then move into predictive analytics, which says, what's likely to happen and prescriptive analytics starts to change the future. That's where we need to be, which is through things like scenario analysis. So if you can run thousands of scenarios uh, by using machine learning, et cetera, then you can work out your optimal scenario for decision-making and managing a project. And the next challenge is associated with data. So we've got loads and loads of data out there, but we don't really leverage it. We don't understand its quality and completeness. We've got loads of use cases. And the use cases today would be, I've got a, um, a project board in three weeks time and I need to present to my boss. And your boss will think like he's always thought for the past 10 years. If you think like a bot, then you could think, so what is gonna go wrong next week? So your use cases will start to evolve. Uh, tell me what the top eight risks are gonna be on my project are based around those four projects that's gone before. So what's the patterns in the data? And have you got enough data volumes? What can we do to process and clean and curate this data? And do we really trust the data? I think that's the most important thing. So we run this project data analytics community and Crossrail I came to present in August 2018. And they presented this slide. And this was a killer slide for me. It really drove home why we need to do things differently. So just think about Crossrail. It's a one through project. So they rock up, uh, they dig a big hole under London, uh, put some train track down signals, uh, put some rolling stock in it, build some stations. And then a Crossrail itself closes because its job is done and it's transferred over to Rail for London and they operate the railway. So all the stuff in red is used by the railway. Um, and they use that to maintain the asset. And all the stuff in blue 
is essentially a big exhaust plume that comes out the back of a project. There are all the schedules, etc. It doesn't need to be used again because it's not Crossrail's job to build another Crossrail. It's Crossrail's job just to come together to deliver that uh, project and those outcomes that go with it. So all of that data is sat somewhere in a cloud and it's potentially never going to see the light of day again. I've tried to get my hands on it. And it's really, really hard to get my hands on it. And I found out the digital lead, I've been to see Michelle Dix, who was a co-nominee. Both of us were nominated for the APM's Mike Nichols Award for Inspiration last year. And I went to see her and she's leading Crossrail too. And she's some of the, see, seen some of that data. And she's saying we could potentially get hold of it, but what's its utility? So uh, back in August of 2018, there were data in there, about 26,000 changes. It was three billion pounds spent on risk and contingency and change management. And that's now increased to about six billion. So if you think that's 50% more than the base cost is spent on risk contingency and change. So that's a huge number. And that can tell us a lot about future project delivery got installation reports, et cetera, et cetera. So that data is sat there and people are nervous about releasing it because they think it's going to get the front page of the Sunday Times. They're nervous about giving it to competitors because there's commercial value in there, et cetera. So we can't get hold of that data. And this is a public project. And it'd be fine if you deliver one railway and that's it. But we're just about to deliver HS2 and Crossrail uh, 2 is still a project, it's still formulating, and still look at the cost benefit analysis on it. So we're still going to be laying track, we're still going to be digging holes and putting tunnels in them, we're still going to be building stations and putting signals and buying rolling stock. So we should be learning so much from this, but we don't. Because we look at the next project, we're always looking forward. So what we need to do is to set up this uh, concept of a data trust. So what a data trust enables us to do is to securely pull this data where we can all work together around these defined use cases. So we can say we need to solve these problems in the future. Have we got the right data to solve those problems? If we've not, then let's do a gap analysis on it. Let's address those use cases and refine the data model and get more data and then keep iterating through these use cases. So we've been working with uh, so we've got Calpine, Keir, Mace and various other people to set up this notion of a construction data trust. And you can go to the website, which is datatrust.construction and start to look into this. We're also doing some work with the Oil and Gas Authority and the Oil and Gas Technology Centre to set something similar up for the oil and gas industry. And that's starting to get some traction as well. So if we can start to pull this data, it's not share it, because I wouldn't share my data with you necessarily, you wouldn't share it with me, but you might want to give it to a third party who's going to independently steward it for you so you can do some cool things with it so that's where we're looking to go in the future it's getting some traction we've got over 70 organizations who's very interested in collaborating on it so why do we want to do this why do we need to make a change so this is research which was conducted on 12,000 major projects by alex budzia and he came to the meetup last year and presented on this to a packed crowd and he's got some data in there that shows you there's some projects which are predisposed to a small amount of variance and some projects like the Olympics are predisposed to massive variance. And those Olympics projects have got zero schedule variance because they're always plugged in for a specific date, but they've got massive cost variance. So different projects have got a different predisposition to variance. And there's a load of factors and a load of features associated with those projects which are data driven, which we can start to look into. And if we look into those projects, we start to draw some uh, charts around it. From those 12,000 projects, only 47.5% of them were on, bud uh, on budget or less than budget. And if you include time in that, so it's on time and on budget, 7.8%. And if you include benefits in it, it's only 0.5%. So that's the likelihood of a successful project is 0.5%. And I find that absolutely shocking. You know, as a project manager, uh, I find that criminal, right? As we've been doing this for years and years and years, 
and the best we can do is 0.5% of projects are coming in on budget, on time and on benefits. Now, if we keep doing what we keep doing and we keep tweaking stuff, you know, in 10 years time, we could probably get up to 0.6 or 0.7, but we need to radically change what we're doing. It's not a tweak we need, we need some radical differences. So what people talk about is mine, we need to get better at learning from one project to the next. So we need all these lessons learned systems, right? So I spent a lot of time researching into these lessons learned systems. And I looked at NASA, for instance, and they've got all these massive lessons learned systems. And in 2001, uh, the GAO come along, which is the equivalent of the UK's NASA and Audit Office. And they said, they published a big report, you can go and Google it. And they said, uh, there's limited uh, sharing of lessons. Uh, there's uh, dissatisfaction in the process because it's very uh, process monkey driven. Uh, there's barriers in terms of culture and lack of time and when they write these lessons down and nobody goes and uses them so they gave them a big beating for it and they gave them some budget to go and fix it so they went away and and, and had a look at it they came back 11 years later and said it's not routinely used it's ill-defined strategies and in terms of money they put money into it take the money away um it's not consistently invested in and it tends to be done because they're told to do it, not because they want to do it. And there's a lack of monitoring associated with it. So if NASA can't solve this, and they're going to space every now and again, and they need to learn from one space launch to the next, then what's the hope for the rest of us? So I then looked at some data from Australia um, and from New Zealand. So the one on the left-hand side is from uh, New Zealand, and the one from the right-hand side is from Australia. And the one on the right hand side, they stopped producing these reports in about 2012. And I read a few of these reports and they start to say the same thing is basically do your job properly. <laughs> it says we've written all this down in the body of knowledge and it might be a PM book or it might be the APM's body of knowledge and we're not following it. And all they're doing is writing down what we already know. And they start to publish these things New Zealand said in 2013, we had these sort of issues occurring, etc. And you'll see that 12% of the issues in 2013 were associated with governors and now it's 16%. Is it really getting better? Is there a massive improvement in one area? Not really. You know, it's not really spiking in certain places. So these are big government departments who's trying to make this better by doing all those lessons and then analysis and it doesn't work. So I work with this chap called Stephen Duffield, who got a PhD off the back of seven years worth of research into it. I wrote this paper with him and it got published. And the paper for me is saying, this process does not work of lessons learned. We need to do something very different. And that different thing is, instead of taking all of those uh, complex situations and boiling it up to a few sentences, we don't need to do that anymore. That was fine for 40 years ago, but we've now got systems that enable us to play in the data. So let's work in the data Let's use the data to assist us. So throw away lessons learned. Let's stop doing it. It's process monkey stuff. Let's move away and start to do something a lot better. So the third change in terms of the big challenges that we need to address is this lack of capability and capacity. Right. So we like this at the moment. We're not planning for it. And it's not just about one profession either. So it's not just about uh, project managers. It's about uh, data scientists, um, app developers, data engineers and project professionals all working together to address this problem. So things are starting to change and I'm seeing these early adopters. Once you start to get it, if you get your data pipelines in place, you'll probably have three or four more years of data than a slow adopter. And if that three or four years of data starts to give you some insights to really uh, change your productivity and your profitability, you will seriously outperform other people. So what can we do to respond? So what I'm finding at the moment is there's organisations out there and saying, so what do we need to do? Do we need a data analyst team which sits centrally and these project managers and project controls people are go and feed into them? So you go and phone up and say, what well, a data analyst for an hour and they come and do some stuff for you. Or do you federate that capability and give everyone a bit of capability? And the problem is, if you think about project controls, if it becomes a very, very data-driven role, what is your current project control person going to do 
if you don't start to move towards the thing on the right. What's your benefits manager going to do? What's your project manager going to do? Uh, so you then start to finish up with these people who'll be sat around for part of the time twiddling the thumbs because somebody else is going to start doing a chunk of their work. So it makes them inefficient and you make the system inefficient by doing that. So what we need to create is this pie shaped person. So he's got a broad understanding of the business. He's got one leg in project delivery and one leg in data analyst. And we're calling that a project data analyst. And I think that's going to be a new role in the future. And I think it's going to be an evolution of where we are today. So in terms of the specialism, where do you want to be? So do you want to be a translator? And that's a person who is able to uh, communicate between uh, project managers and data analysts and try and find some solutions. Do you want to be a generalist practitioner where you can start to do some of this clever stuff or do you want to be a specialist practitioner? And what a specialist practitioner is, is probably a ninja in machine learning or um, a deep power BI specialist and that's what they do. They understand all the latest releases and all the functionality and can do the data engineering at the back of it. So that's going to drive your technical uh, performance and your technical ability. So in terms of those opportunities, these people are going to be uh, uh, pathfinders and they're going to be driving these brand new insights and these capabilities. So it's a new career path and there's going to be a lot of emergent capabilities out of it. Like, for instance, uh, can we start to automatically uh, schedule a project? Uh, can we start to automatically going to predict what's going to happen? So in the project data analytics community, um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was uh, three weeks ago now, we asked them two questions. And we said, have you got 100 points? And what would you do with those 100 points in terms of these statements? Which statements really ring true to you? And they said 32% uh, of those votes went to, we're underestimating, underestimating those impacts of advanced data analytics. 26% uh, of those votes thought in the next five years, we're going to have automated schedules and automated cost plans. I think in some instances, we're getting close to that already. They think it's going to solve uh, project cost growth and things and start to reduce it by 30%. Or uh, some people think it's going to be less than 10%. And that depends on what sort of projects you're going to be working on. And in terms of the blockers, they thought it was lack of skills, leadership understanding, and not enough data. And we're trying to solve some of those problems uh, through lack of skills through the meetup community, etc. We also said to them, what's the impact on your role? And 42% of people thought, go, this is massively important, and they need to adapt. And only 8% of people thought it's going to be a slight difference. So I'd like to ask a question now, which is, and this is a mentee question for you, is where does your organisation start at the moment? So where are you currently? So if you think about option one, you've got a bit of a random strategy. So it's driven by a few enthusiasts. And if those enthusiasts lead, uh, leave the organisation, then their enthusiasm goes and, and things stop happening. It's pretty ad hoc. You tend to do it under the radar. You know, you ain't got a lot of money to do it personality driven. Option two is it's experimental. So it's working on these small experiments. You've got agreement with your boss. You can go and have a play about with some stuff. You do some pilots, but it's done on a fairly systematic basis. And option three is it's, it's quite strategic and you've got a big budget to go and managing it with. So if we can just go back to a Mentimeter uh, and see what people are scoring. So if you can all go into Mentimeter and just log back in again. So five, six, seven, one, six, five. So there's one person who's got a strategic approach. I'll be interested to see what that is, you know, and see if you're really driving it with a data strategy and all the things that go with it. You've got an investment case and some of the vision that we've been talking about. Are you really driving it? So there's six people who seem to be experimenting at the moment. I think that's great. And there's one person who's got a random approach. Um, and strategic, I've not seen so through Project Data Analytics community, I've seen a lot of people saying they're taking a strategic approach. And when I have a chat with them about it, I've struggled to see that strategic nature that they've got board level investment in it. They know exactly where they want to be in 12 months, 18 months and three years time. 
and they see this start to upskill people, they're starting to get the transformation strategy that goes with it. So I'll be interested in digging into that detail in a bit more, more, more depth, really. And um, if you can reach out to me afterwards and we can have a conversation about it, then maybe we can invite you along to the Project Data Analytics community as well and we'll get you involved. So I'll go back to the uh, uh, presentation again. Um, so in terms of the starting point, as an individual, I think it's about what do you want from this journey? So have you got a passion and have you got the time for it? And if you've got the passion and the time, wait for the next slide and I'll start to walk you through it. If it's maybe, you've got to un understand what's going to start to influence your decision. So that's some of it is the fear. You know, it's really hard. It sounds really geeky. I don't want to get into that because it's not my bag. It's the unknown. You don't really understand what the art of possible is. And it's a lack of time. So that might be through evening uh, sessions or structured training. You don't understand the impact on your role as well. So on some roles like a QS or a document controller, you know, their roles are really going to get blown apart by project data analytics and some more people fo focus roles are less so. Um, and where's your market going on this? And if you're not really interested in it, I would say to you, uh, keep an eye on it, start to understand the art of possible and pick a niche and start to work it. So if you want to get into this, then this is our recommendation in terms of uh, getting into it. So you start off by going to a community event such as this one and meetup events, etc. And then you start to get into some practical experience. So we've got Project Hack and I can talk about that in a bit where you start to get some practical experience and some hands on about solving problems. And then you get into your MOOCs. Now, there's a lot of people in India get certificates of the yin yang and they've got all these little nano degrees. But if you've not had the practical experience and you've not done some of it, it's very difficult to sell that to a future employer. There's competitions out there like Kaggle, for instance, where you can win some big prizes if you're really good at what you're doing. And there's other places where you start to share a code and you start to fork other people's code and adapt it and apply it. And what projecting success is always getting into as well is a more structured training. So we believe people need to get on this journey. So we've set up this thing called a project data analyst apprenticeship and that enable, enables people to get some structured training. And don't think about apprenticeships in 1980s language, which is about, you know, a school leaver and you go on a three year scheme where you've got to be time served to be a plumber. It's not that sort of thing anymore. So apprenticeship basically is there's a set of money there sat by government. It's 0.5% of pay bill for large employers and it gets spent on just reskilling people and getting them ready for this new future. So in terms of your technical competence as well, you've got to think, where do you want to be on this spectrum? Do you want to be collating data? Do you want to get into the automated collection of data? Or do you want to be uh, connecting and qualifying and validating that data and integrating it together? Or do you want to be doing the clever stuff? And your learning curve really starts to ramp up once you get into the clever stuff. It's not just learning it, it's moving at pace. So you've got to keep plugged into it. So you've got to invest a lot of your own time in terms of keeping up to speed with it. So do you want to be an operative in terms of a tool jockey and just understand these tools? Or do you want to be a proper analyst? Because that's about personal investment and, and it's the investment of your time and your capabilities to make these things happen. So in terms of structured training, we've got this Project Data Academy. So it's the equivalent of a foundation degree. And some people's already got degrees and I think, well, I should be doing a master's. And I'd say a master's is about learning theory and about the application of that theory. This is about hands-on application of these tools and the way these tools are going to work. So we're running four cohorts a year um, and it's for all ages and experiences and see it as CPD. So there's a quote there from Pedro and Pedro is a senior program manager in Baker Hughes. Um, uh, he's older than 30, I shan't tell you his age, but he's, he's definitely older than 30. Um, and he just sees this, you know, he's doing a job at the moment where he's munging data a lot. And he said, I can do my job a lot, lot easier if I can find a way of applying these sort of techniques. And we've got people who are uh, quantitative surveyors, project managers, document controllers, all sorts of people on it. 
and they see that their jobs are going to change massively. So we've got some of them, McAlpine, we've got Keir, Baker Hughes, um, and we've got some other big organisations interested in as well. So in terms of um, upskilling as well, so um, if you could go back to Mentimeter, I've got a couple of questions now. So if we just whiz back to Mentimeter. So what's your approach? We covered that one. Uh, upskilling in project data analytics. So is this your bag? Is it something you're considering at the moment? You're looking into it um, and you'd like to explore signing up for the apprenticeship. Is this something that you're going to be interested in? There's loads of materials. So if you go to projectdataanalytics.uk and that tells you about uh, some of the things we've been doing. There's a, um, a community website there as well. So we've got loads of hack videos on there. We've got blogs, we've got a newsletter as well. So once a month we scrape the internet for the latest things that's going on in the world of project data analytics. And that's quite interesting that five of you um, is gonna be looking into it and two people, it's not my bag. I'm interested in what you're doing at the moment because I think most roles, it will impact your role. It's, it's the extent based upon the sort of thing you're doing. So next question, which is back to this uh, first question that I posed to you. So um, in terms of this presentation, has it changed the way that you think about project data analytics? So I think we had two and nine before, did we, Joel? Yeah, I think we had, uh, was it two unsure and nine significant, wasn't it, I think? Yeah. So um, I'd be interested in your views now in terms of what you think one person thinks it's going to look very, very different. Five people think it's going to be significant. So I was hoping that I could convince a few more of you that it's going to look very different because um, from what I'm seeing of this emergent capability, um, I think I think a lot of people's jobs are going to be are looking hugely different as a consequence. So I'll just go back to the final slide or two, Joel, and then um, I'll start to wrap up. So we've done those two. So there's some QR codes there if you want to come along to Project Hack. We've got the next event on the 27th and 28th of June. It's normally in London, but it's online. We've got 180 people signed up to that so far. And the project meetups, as I say, we've got a community of, of getting close to 6,000 now. So um, uh, get involved if you can and, and spread the word and and share some good practice. So that's our website, projectedsuccess.co.uk. Those are the things we do. That's the community website, which is projectdataanalytics.uk. So we run that for the community, and that's the Data Trust website. So so check those out. Take a screen grab of that if you're interested, and come and find me on LinkedIn. So that's it, Joel.